recording um okay hi everyone uh, welcome back to the theory seminar as you can see dr vincent kohanadat from google research zurich is a speaker for today as well so last time he talked about the recent advances in uh, metric clustering uh, today he's going to talk about graph clustering uh, once again thanks everyone for joining us and vincent uh, we're excited to have you again and the stage is yours Yep. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, everyone. Thanks a lot for the uh, very nice invitation. Um, again, just as like time, uh, last time, feel free to interrupt any time. If you have question, if you if something isn't clear, like just you know, uh, stop me and like uh, I, I can't see the chat directly, so just uh, you know, uh, uh, speak out loud uh, your question, and you know, I'll be happy to answer. Okay. So this is a talk that is uh, uh, again on clustering but with a um, slightly different angle than what we saw last time. Maybe the last talk was uh, more uh, uh, theory oriented, like we we looked at all possible connections between this clustering problem and like uh, famous basic uh, problem like set cover. And uh, we did like a bit of complexity theory, uh, various type of algorithms. But uh, for these talks, maybe uh, I want to, you know, uh, take a different perspective and rather look at uh, insight that we can take from like um, algorithm design for like theoretical objectives and this insight how we can use them for practice. So, you know, these are like papers that are uh, last last time I talked about papers at Stock Fox so the uh, conferences this time it's more about like NeurIPS ICML type uh, conferences with, you know, things that can be useful for for practice as well. So this is joint work with a, a lot of people. Uh, thanks everyone, like for 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 this uh, for this uh, for uh, for nice uh, uh, work together. And uh, for this talk, I will define clustering a bit differently than what we did this design it like the last time. Um, so here we are given a graph. So we have like vertices and edges between the vertices, and the goal is to identify dense subgraphs. So for example, if you have a social network, a set of genes of species, or like the World Wide Web. What you would like to find are essentially communities or a uh, group of points that are densely connected, so that share a lot of edges together, and that are less densely connected to the rest of the world. Okay, so essentially, like to the extreme, you can think of cliques, like uh, of, of Dijon cliques. Like if you have like subgraph of your network that of, of your graph that are like uh, that have all pairwise possible edges. Uh, and that have no edges to the other subgraph, then that these are your clusters. Okay, so here an edge would represent, for example, uh, you know, uh, um, some relationship between between uh, the elements, like elements of the vertices, edges mark that uh, there is some similarity between the two endpoints. Okay, uh, exactly. So that's what we want to do. We, if I try to define it slightly more concretely. We want to identify very dense subgraphs with a little bit of expansion, like very tiny expansion. Okay, uh, essentially maximal subgraph that are dense with small expansion. Okay, so there are two steps that we want to take to answer this question. This question, as you can see, is not yet very formal. I didn't define like an objective function, and I didn't define uh, an algorithm for it yet. So, what I would like to do is uh, first, the first step I would have in this talk. Um, uh, is first like look at an objective function for this uh, for this uh, a model for this problem, essentially. So um, uh, there are two ways to model it, like one with the modularity objective, one with the correlation clustering objective, and um, I'll describe the two uh, uh, models. I will also argue why these models make sense to me. Uh, of course, they're not the only one that makes sense. Like we can discuss uh, other models, but I think these ones are pretty nice, and uh, and uh, we can see that. And uh, the second step will be then to, you know, try to define algorithm that can optimize this objective function. Okay, and I will also try to uh, keep in mind this computational model um, uh, where uh, we basically try to capture what's happening when you have a lot of uh, machines available, like when you have a big graph, massive data, and you want to uh, uh, still have some efficient algorithm. So I will try to work in this massively parallel computation model. The algorithm I'm going to describe, they are not tailored to this massively parallel computation model, and I think they are interesting uh, uh, as on their own. But it's you know one feature that is nice there is that they work in these models, 
and that we could actually experiment with them on really large uh, data. So, for example, uh, if your total size of your network is like M, your number of edges, then uh, I give you like P machines, and we should think of P as being like M sub sublinear in M, like M to the epsilon, for some epsilon. And each processor has uh, some unlimited computation power. Like, you know, you can do whatever you want. Here, of course, uh, we'll just do polynomial time computation because at the end we want to implement it, so it's can't, it can't be too crazy. But the, the memory it has is like some M divided by P. So essentially your, your graph, your network, all your data is spread evenly on, on the machines. And of course you can have exactly this or like up to polylog factor, it's exactly, the, it's exactly like, you know, uh, evenly split. And in each round of computation and communication, uh, each processor can do arbitrary computation, sends or receive M over P uh, bits of information. All its memory, essentially. It can, it can flush out its memory and receive a new uh, um, thing. And the goal in this model is to minimize the number of rounds of communication and, 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 com and uh, computation. Okay, so let me discuss now the objective. So the first objective I want to talk about is this modularity objective. Uh, it comes not really from uh, uh, the TCS community, but rather from the statistical physics community. And um, there you are given a graph, okay, an edge between two elements U and V if they are similar, okay, so it's not a weighted graph, it's unweighted. And what you would like to find is a partition uh, into arbitrary, uh, like the, the number of clusters doesn't really matter, like you know, you can take as many clusters as you want. And you want to maximize the following quantity. So what is this quantity? You will sum over all clusters uh, of the gain that you have, the, co the, the value that you get for the cluster. The value you get for the cluster is the following, is that for each UV, you get the value of one if there is an edge. So you'll get the bonus of one if there is an edge. And uh, otherwise you get the all. And, but in all cases, in all cases, you will uh, subtract the degree of U times the degree of V divided by the uh, total number of edges, twice the total number of edges, the sum of the degrees. Okay. And uh, you want to maximize this quantity. So now you can ask, what is the intuition behind this? Um, so actually, you can phrase it like this. Like you can see that this function for a given cluster, fix a cluster, so this, this, this part of the objective uh, compares the number of edges in the cluster here minus, uh, uh, to, it compares it to the uh, uh, number of edges that you would see uh, in a random network with prescribed degree distribution. So this is like the expected uh, number of edges in the cluster. If you had like, uh, uh, if you if you if you look at a graph, a random graph that ensure that uh, the degree of u is is what it is and the degree of v is what it is, and divided by two random edges. And um, so so this is like really comparing like the number of edges you have in your cluster to you know, an expected number of edges you would have if the graph in the cluster, if the graph were random, like if you had a random cluster, essentially. So in that case, you know, you're just like, uh, it's like hypothesis testing in some sense, like you are trying to see whether you are far from the average and the farther you are from the average, like the more edges you have compared to the average, the, ha the happier you are, okay? Because you are getting far further and further away from the, what you would have with a random cluster. And let me give you some more features of this uh, objective. Um, so first, if I give you that all the vertices are in the same cluster, then your modularity is zero. So it's not very good. Like you can, like of course, modularity can be positive. So you get a modularity of zero. So it's like your baseline. If you put all everyone on the same cluster, you get some baseline of zero. So now, essentially, when you are maximizing modularity, you are always comparing to zero, which would be like you putting put everything everyone in his own cluster. I'm uh, sorry, everyone in the same cluster. Now, for example, if you have a G, a graph G that consists of two Dijon click, which is like an extreme case where you have two clear clusters, each of size like let's say n over two, then the maximum modularity clustering is to you know have C1 in one cluster, C2 in, a, in another cluster. So that's very good. Now, if I come and I give you G with instead of two clicks, two Dijon clicks, I give you five Dijon clicks of size like you know, n over five each then the max modularity clustering is going to be C1, C2, C3, C4, C5. So the, the, the one interesting feature of this objective function is that the number of clusters is not hard-coded. It's like uh, 
uh, in some sense, it's data driven. It's like, you know, uh, something that comes out of the data. Like it's not some, some input parameter that you would have to fine tune and so on. So it's good to have less parameter. So that's something that is pretty useful. Okay. So, okay. So step one of this part has been done. Like we have an optimization problem, which is this modularity objective. Now the second step is, and you know, the, the, the argument I gave in the previous slide were that, you know, it seems like a reasonable model for us. Uh, now the second step we would like is an algorithm for optimizing this objective function. Okay, we would like to know what to do. So there is this uh, Louvain algorithm, which is very similar to algorithm. It's a local search algorithm, so similar to what we've discussed uh, like uh, uh, 10 days ago. You have, um, so the input is your graph with an edge between two vertices. If you are similar, we start with a partition P where each vertex is in its own cluster. So everyone is like, you know, by itself. And um, uh, given a partition, you know, of, of, uh, of, the, of your graph, you consider the set of vertices U that are such that moving the vertex from its current part, VI, let's say, to another part, VJ, will increase the overall modularity. And if U is, if, if, if the size of U is, uh, is larger than zero, then you can pick a random vertex in U and move it to its part so as to increase the modularity. And then you repeat step two, like, you know, as, to, as long as you can increase the overall modularity, uh, you pick a vertex uh, that wants to move to change part. And uh, among all vertices that, would, that want to change part, you can pick one at random and uh, you move it and you increase the modularity and you repeat. And at the end, you, find, you finish with the part. This is almost like the Louvain algorithm that is uh, that is used in practice. It's a very it's a very well used algorithm. It's like the paper is like fifteen thousand citation, and it's um, it's a, it's a graph partitioning algorithm that is pretty useful. It's not quite the same I'm writing here. It's just like a slightly simplification. In fact, in the real algorithm that is used in practice, when you are stuck in a local optimum, you will contract each cluster and uh, keep parallel edges. And you will uh, uh, now uh, apply the local search on the contract graph. So that now you can make, make bigger moves, local moves, because you are moving. You can merge two clusters, for example. You are moving cluster around. So this is the this is the real algorithm. I don't want to do this contraction set because this is a nightmare to analyze, as we'll see. But I this is like the basic, and I think the basic already works pretty well. But uh, um, you know, let's work with that for now. Now the question you can ask is like, okay, this this fifteen thousand citation paper, how good it is? Like, uh, in, like you know, can we argue that it's a good algorithm, or is just why, why is it working so well? So there are two answers to this. The first answer answer to this is that in theory there is no approximation guarantee in the worst case, even for like you know so, small families of graphs. Like if you are looking at I don't know like a planar graph or like a very tiny like a very uh, well structured class of graphs there is no approximation warranty for modularity and stuff like you have to deal with like additive approximation etc it's a bit of a not well not so nice objective function there has been some works but you know it's not really telling us much in practice you know uh yeah this these slides are like like uh, like uh, you know one year old so so it was like eight thousand now it's like fifteen thousand so you know it's like a really big uh big method like very well used everywhere so what we showed in like our New York paper last year was that, okay, maybe we can try to, instead of uh, trying to show in the worst case that the Louvain algorithm works well, which is not possible because the problem is hard, then maybe we can try to go beyond the worst case analysis and find graphs, identify graph properties of the graphs that makes the algorithm uh, work well. So for example, a classic uh, uh, model for graph with uh, uh, cluster structure is the stochastic block model, where you have a set of vertices that are um, made of two that unknown uh, equal size part, A1 and H2, and you have an edge between, between vertices that are in the same part with probability P and an edge between communities, uh, different communities with probability Q, and we have P greater than Q. So that the essentially it's exactly the type of scenario we want to model we have that uh the part a1 is more is is more densely connected than the uh, uh cut between a1 and a2 
Okay, so we have a uh, little, little smaller expansion, uh, not that great expansion from on the cluster A1. The cluster A1 is very dense, doesn't have that many edges outgoing A1. Okay, and you, we are given a graph that is generated according to this model. And what you, your goal is to find the A1 and A2, like the ground truth community. Okay. Now, Vincent, can I ask yeah. a quick question? Yeah. So, so you, I mean, the goal here is to analyze this algorithm and not because like spectral methods do work for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So you have optimal methods that can go down to the information theoretic threshold to uh, identify A1, A2. You, you, these methods exist. But here, I just would like to understand where the, like, uh, yeah, the, the, we, what we are trying to do is that, okay, if Louvain is not working for this class of graphs, then maybe we can come up with a better algorithm. Uh -huh. Right? So, you know, if this class, this kind of, yeah, this class of graph is modeling like easy scenario. So if Louvain is not working for easy scenario, we should really be improving it. Like maybe it's possible to get something much better. And it, like while the approximation guarantee is bad, the runtime of the algorithm is quite good, even. Um, yeah, so so the worst case running time for Louvain is like N squared, is like the, yeah, it could be N squared or N, N, N times M. Uh -huh. But actually what we would like to show is that in practice, okay, in practice, the running time is like uh, N log N or M, M log N, something like this. So it's, it's much faster in practice than in, in worst case. Uh -huh. And what we would like to show as well in this work is not only that Louvain manages to find A1, A2, but also that it uh, converges pretty efficiently. Correct. And final question. So, yeah. the, like um, in the algorithm, so maybe previous slide, you picked a vertex like you, at random in this set U, uh, yeah. and not like greedily. So you didn't pick the vertex which say increase the modularity by the. Right. Is that a conscious choice, or is it just because? That's what's uh, going so it makes the analysis much simpler. I think if you pick the one that gives you the best, you can argue that you know there is a martingale behind it, and that you know it will it will be it will you will recover the result. I think, but it uh -huh. will will require another lemma that is maybe not directly implied by what we are doing. But I think it should be true. It's just uh -huh. like uh, for ease of exposition that I would I would say we did that. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Um, good. So what we managed to show uh, yeah, on this New York paper is that if the ratio of P minus Q, which is the difference between like, you know, the P is the probability to have an edge internal to a cluster, Q is the probability to have an edge across clusters. So P minus Q uh, divided by square root P, which is the signal to noise ratio, is larger than one over N to the one fix, one over one over fix minus epsilon, then Louvain will output A1, A2 with high probability and in linear linear time. And as 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 yeah, as was pointed out just right before, the spectral method method that are known for this this type of problems, uh, or like uh, even if you want to go up to the exact uh, information theoretic threshold, you can use SDPs. You need to use SDPs actually. You will replace the six with a two. So the the, the bound is is significantly better if you use the other method. But um, <laughs> it's already a, a regime that is non-trivial. Like uh, people didn't know, for example, how to do this regime until like uh, the late 90s, for example. So it's not it's not the state of the arts, which has been achieved like, you know, five, five years ago or something. But it's like something that was already like somewhat not trivial. OK, and OK, and the conjecture. OK, I must say that, OK, if you modify the algorithm a little bit, then you can put a four. You can literally improve the analysis. It's just that we don't know how to deal with like uh, some dependencies on the graph uh, on, on the edges on the choices of the algorithm. Uh, and the conjecture is that like two here is the right value. Like I think I think with Louvain, up to polylog factor, you should be able to go down up to the uh, information theoretic threshold. But we didn't know how to prove it. OK, so let me show you uh, the let me show you a simple proof uh, that is not giving you necessarily the best we can do, but is you know, showing up, showing, showing some, some like of the of the main ideas. So we have uh, uh, two parts in the proof, and it's kind of funny because I'm not sure these two parts should exist, but it's still really two parts. We don't know how to make like a unified approach for this. Maybe that's the way. That's why we are losing a little bit as well on the on the threshold we are getting. 
But essentially, we have a first part which says that okay, when you start with your uh, uh, um, um, with, with your initial partitioning, uh, you can show that on average, Louvain will place uh, the vertices of A1 into the part containing the most vertices of A1. So you will like you will uh, you will start correctly classifying vertices, right? Because at the end, what you want is that all the vertices of A1 are in the part of containing A1, all the vertices of A2 are in the same part. So you know if you uh, if you start you know putting vertices of A1 on one side, vertices of A2 on the other side, then you are happy. And that's what we managed to show that on average this is what happened. And then when we have the second part, which is interesting on its own, which says that so if you if the algorithm reaches a clustering where you have one part, which is such that it contains many vertices of A1. So let's say, so if you have, uh, you know, N over uh, N vertices in total, N over four vertices uh, on this part. So, so A, the, the part P has size like N over two. So A1 intersect P is like slightly more than half of P, okay? So A1, uh, P is made of slightly more than half of its vertices are from A1. Okay. And when I say slightly more, I say, you know, half plus n to the one minus epsilon, which is like not half plus a constant factor. It's like half plus something that is sublinear. Then you can show that, oops, then we can show that Louvain next will only make good swaps. So it will only continue moving vertices of A1 to this part P and vertices of A2 to the other part. So it's it then after that point, you know that with high probability, you are only doing the right choices, which means what? Which means that if you know how to uh, initialize Louvain in the right way, like you know, if you know how to start with a partition that is already like kind of uh, making somewhat educated guesses on your uh, like you know, it's not a random partition. If your partition is uh, reasonably good, then you can show that. Um, you're in a, you are you, you will make good choices afterwards so these are the two parts so, <laughs> so yeah. you, you mentioned this but let me ask it again so the algorithm does not need to know that the like the k equals 2 so it it will just that's right that's right so correct so yeah so one thing that yeah exactly so so that's for the next slide so i will assume that uh, we start with a random two partition uh -huh. onto v1 v2 Okay. And yeah, and I think you can relax it a little bit, but I don't know how to make the proof work if you start with everyone on a single cluster. This I don't know how to make it work. Like if you have, if your initial partition, if your initial partition for the problem, for the algorithm is like everyone on his own cluster, then I don't know how to make it work. And I can discuss a little more this, but it sounds like uh, this assumption is not that easy to remove if you want to go down with like, Cluster of size uh, one or two or something, constant size. Okay, okay. Okay, so that's the assumption I'm gonna make for this proof. Uh, and of course, without loss of generality, if we start with a random two partition, we know that, let's say the side V1 has slightly more uh, vertices of A1 than the uh, of V2. Okay, we can assume like, if I just toss a coin, like, you know, one of the two is such that this is happening, and the other one is satisfying the other thing for A2. So, you know, I might assume that V1 has slightly more vertices of A1. Okay. Um, and we can make this assumption too. This assumption too, you can easily remove. So it's just this is just for simplification of the exposition. It's just, I'm gonna just say that a vertex is gonna go from VI to VJ if it has more neighbors in uh, VJ than in VI, okay? Uh, so here is the picture. So we have V1 that has slightly more element of A1, and V2 that has slightly more element, of, uh, ele slightly more element of A2. And I'm going to say, that, okay, this vertex is going to go to V2 if it has, like, you know, for example, like seven neighbors here, only six here, and then he's going to move. Okay, and that's what the algorithm is doing. Okay, this assumption of like you know the number of vertices if it's not exactly what's happening in uh, Louvain because in Louvain you are maximizing modularity. But if you just replace that, okay, this vertex is moving if it mo maximizes modularity, then uh, the uh, uh, proof will go through as well. 
Okay. And we have to, we want to measure the progress done by the algorithm. And for this, we have this uh, notion of, uh, uh, um, we have this delta, this value delta, which is the um, imbalance, what we call the imbalance. And we call it like, you know, uh, so, you know, A1 has size N over 2. So this is like the intersection of V1, and, uh, sorry, A1, v, V1 has size N over 2. And so V1 intersect A1 is just like, uh, you know, how much more than half of the cluster is uh, belongs to A1. Okay, so half of the cluster belongs to A1 is like N over 4. Half of the cluster of V1 is like N over 4. What we want to compute here is how much more than the half than half of the cluster we have. And as we said, at first we have like we have only root and extra vertices of A1 uh, on top of the on the uh, on the on the on the half of the cluster. And the first observation you can make here is that if my since my cut my my initial cut is random, my graph is random. Then I can I can show that for each vertex u in A1, in expectation, uh, the the degree of u to v1 is lar is larger than the degree of u to v2 by uh, a, a, a delta times p minus q uh, factor. So actually, I can show that um, in expectation for each vertex of a1, it has more neighbors in V1. So I'm happy because in expectation, I'm going to make the right move. So this is like, uh, in, so in the drawing, we have vertices of A1 have more neighbors in V1. So if they are already in V1, they want to stay in V1. And if they are in V2, they want to move to V2, to V1. So we are happy. And same thing for the vertices of A2. They have more neighbors in V2, so they would like to go to V2 unless they are already in V2 and they want to stay. So we are happy. In expectation, at the beginning, we we're very happy. So one thing we could do is that uh, the, for each vertex v in A1, the probability that uh, the degree of v is um, to v1 is larger than the degree of v to v2 is larger than is at least one half plus omega of p minus q over square root p, which is again like the signal to noise ratio, which is what you expect. So you can show this. Uh, up to some constant, this is like the right bound. This is this analysis is like tight. You can show that if you start with random cut so for this random graph, you get one half plus plus this. This is your thing. So now the issue. Okay, so what is the issue? Is that how do I get this bound? I get this bound because I have a random cut, and I have a random graph. So I have a lot of randomness, and I can show that okay for all vertices, this uh, this is gonna hold. Now, let me assume that I can use this inequality to argue that, okay, I have a good probability, meaning larger than one half. It's not like high probability, but with probability larger than one half, the algorithm is gonna make the right move. It's gonna make move a vertex of A1 to V1 or a vertex of A2 to V2. It's not gonna make a bad move, which would be take a vertex of A1 and move it to V2. This is bad. So with more than one half probability, I'm going to be able to argue that the vertex, the algorithm is going to make the right move. Now, I want to argue as well that at the next move, things are going to be going well as well. Okay. But now, the cut I have after I've made the, the first move is not the random cut anymore. So it's not clear that I can, uh, you know, argue that this is true again in the sense that, you know, this was using that the fact that the cut is random. Now, if I if I if my cut is adversarial, then it's not clear that such a, a statement would be true. So this is the issue because now what we would like to do is that we would like to show that this is this statement here is going to be true for many many cuts, right? Because if this statement is true for many many cuts, then you know it's likely that. I do it for the first cut, then the next cut, I can still do it, and so on. I can try to repeat. And I can show that after gamma steps, I have made uh, in expectation gamma times this number the right move, and gamma times one minus this number the wrong move, and I would still have gained essentially gamma times the signal to nose ratio, so I've made progress. Okay, so let me say again. So 
The issue is that we like to have high concentration so that his, this band is true for many swaps, many cuts that we'll get after many swaps. So what we have is that here, each edge belongs to the neighborhood of two vertices, okay? So, you know, each edge, the, the random things that we have are the edges, right? Because that's where they come from. They come from the randomness of the graph. So each edge is like a random value that contributes to at most two of these values here, right? Uh, because each edge influences the ne what, two numbers. The, each edge UV influences the degree of U to some parts and the degree of V to some parts. Okay, so uh, so the neighborhoods, so these random variables, because these are random variables, these random variables are uh, two read random variables. And so you can show that you have almost chain of bounds, slightly weaker bounds than chain of bounds, but we can show that with probability at least one minus this number, the probability of moving a vertex of A1 or intersect V2 to V1, so this is a good move, is at least the probability of moving a vertex of A2 intersect V2 to V1 plus this number. So it's larger than this is the good move. Uh, this is the bad move. Um, and uh, now we are saying that making a good move is larger than making a bad move plus uh, the signal to noise ratio. And this is going to happen uh, with a very large probability. So we are happy because now we have like concentration bounds because these variables are two reads. So we can use some sort of term. So um, good. And now we have some argument that says that uh, this high probability statement that I just gave you implies that the imbalance, so we are, the number of correctly classified vertices is going to increase by uh, one by a constant factor during n to the two sum plus epsilon steps in expectation. So assuming that uh, p minus q over square root p is larger than n to the uh, one, one over six plus epsilon, after two third, after n to the two third steps, we have increased delta to be at least n to the two third plus epsilon. So we started with delta being like root n, now we have a delta that is like omega n to the two sub positive. So after uh, that many steps, we have increased all delta to something. So we're happy. Now, of course, I have used at the pre to, to get this bound here that I'm not detailing too much. To get this bound uh, here, you use the chain of bound type thing, the, the high concentration bound that I have given you at the previous step. Of course, when we are given when we are using this. Uh, chain of bound, we are implicitly using afterwards uh, some sort of union bound. We are saying, okay, uh, it can't be bad for too many cuts, so there is unlikely, it's very unlikely that there is a bad cut that will, we'll never encounter a bad cut. For If we if we run for n to the two third steps, we'll never encounter a bad local optimum. That's what we are saying, essentially. And the way we are proving this is by saying, okay, we have so much concentration that it's, uh, you know, we can take a union bound over all possible cuts we are going to look at. This is not a very tight analysis because we are, we are using a, a union bound, so it's a very weak analysis. Uh, we are saying, okay, uh, all possible cuts are good, but that's not what we need to show that the algorithm is good, right? This is like a, a, a sufficient, but it's not necessary. Okay, so uh, we have, there's also a more careful analysis which uh, can tell you that you don't really need. You can get better. You can get good concentration as well because you don't really need to know which vertices are neighbor of U. You just need to count how many neighborhood vertices of U, neighbors of U, are uh, in V1 or in V2. It's enough to know, uh, like you know, numbers of neighbors in V1, number of neighbors in V2. You don't need to explicitly reveal the randomness of each edge, and so you don't need to have so much concentration. So there is a slightly better analysis that uh, gives you slightly better bounds, that allows you to change the 6 to a 4. But yeah, let me go too much into that. It's, uh, it's yeah, it's getting hairy pretty fast. Uh, OK, so we have this lemma. Uh, so now that's that's what's all the third steps. So, so we are happy. We reach, we show that after n to the two third steps, we reach an imbalance of n to the two thirds. So now what happens when delta is larger than n to the two thirds? So then we can show that the following lemma 
which says that for any such possible cut, uh, any possible cut that is slightly more like, you know, this is not any cut that is such that the number of vertices in A1, uh, or the number of vertices of uh, 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 A1 in V1 is at least half of the number of vertices in uh, V1 plus this number. So all possible cut like this is such that uh, if you look at a subset of V2 intersect A1, so a subset of vertices of V2 that you would like to move to V1 because they belong to A1, of size more than n to the 1 minus epsilon, uh, is, is such, there is no such set that is such that the total degree of the vertices in this set to V1 is smaller than the total degree of these vertices to V2. So that means that there is always one vertex in this set. So for any set of size, uh, at least this, there is always a vertex that wants to move to the right location. So what we can show is that with probability, when delta is large enough, then the algorithm is going to increase delta, uh, like we you know, with with uh, for, for that many for that the fraction of the swap is going to happen. Like you know, before it was one half plus the signal to nose ratio. After this point, we can show that you know the probability that the swap is good is at least one minus one over log n. So with probability one over log n, you make a wrong swap. With probability one minus one over log n, you make a good swap. So then that means that now we are only making good swaps. So the algorithm is going very, very fast. As soon as you reach delta larger than this number, the algorithm is like super fast. It makes most of the time the good the swaps are good. So then that implies that you know uh, you actually converge in near linear time because most of the time you are doing the right thing. So for the next like n swaps, you are going to be doing like correctly classifying n over log n fraction of the vertices. So you can go a little more and then you will finish. So this is pretty this is pretty good. That shows that this algorithm can converge in like near linear time. Uh, and uh, then we have a couple of observations. So first, if we want to go back to this massively parallel computation algorithm, we can do the following algorithm, which is that you have your partition. Now each vertex on one round, each vertex decides, oh, do I want to change or, do, or, or I don't want to change? Do I want to move to the other partition or do I, I don't want to do it? Then you say, okay, everybody decides, do, do they want to change, do they want to change? One round of computation, you make them move partitions, then you repeat. And then you can show that in a constant number of rounds, this is going to converge to the right uh, partitioning. So that's pretty cool, uh, because now we have that, uh, we can show that we have a massively parallel computation algorithm for the stochastic block model. Of course, we assume that P minus Q over square root P is somewhat large, but it can then converge in like constant number of rounds of computation. So that's pretty cool. And then I think this is pretty uh, a pretty nice interpretation of this result as well. Uh, let's assume you have a social network. Uh, there is some event happening. And now at the beginning, everyone has a, a, a personal opinion that is a random num number between zero and one. Like the event is good or is bad. It's a good or bad event that happened. And then, you start talking to your friends and you decide that you know every you know you if you will change your opinion to the majority of your friends so if everyone be, like most of your friends believe that it's a good event then you will believe you, next time you will believe it's good if every majority of your friends believe it's a bad event then you uh, uh, start to believe it's bad now if you are connected uh, in a way that uh, you know you have like two communities your friends are, are crossed among, among two communities, and you have, of course, slightly more friends on your own personal community than on the other side, then you will quickly converge in a constant number of rounds, you will quickly converge to a polarized opinion. Like one side will be all zero, one side will be all one. So if you look at the graph here, for example, for the from the US politics blogosphere, where you have like two groups, and these are like really stochastic block models. Like you have two densely connected subgraphs, red and blue, and with several edges in between, but still much more inside. Then if some, even some unpolitical event starts and um, something non-political happens, 
and like everyone start behaving like zero one randomly. Then after a couple of uh, uh, round of discussions with where you follow the people you are connected to, you will reach the situation where like you know uh, oh one group is believing zero, the other side is believing one. So I think it like it's, I think understanding these dynamics, uh, this uh, yeah, uh, is it can be interesting uh, and uh, and maybe the techniques we have developed here, maybe just a Cassie block model can be a useful model for like you know trying to understand how these. Uh, um, opinions uh, 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 spread. Okay, so that was uh, an interesting aftermath of this, and there are different uh, future work and open problem we can tackle here. Uh, you know, as I yeah, as I mentioned, like you know, the, the, the proof, for example, that we have is really tailored to uh, starting with like two uh, cluster or like constant number of clusters of like linear size. I don't really know if uh, we have like uh, very diverse sizes. Uh, I don't know how to find an algorithm that will be robust to input containing different sizes. Also, if we can come up with a slightly better model for real world graphs. So here we have like a stochastic block model is purely random. We have heterogeneous degree distribution. This is not really what's happening in practice. We can see like power law distribution distribution for the for the degrees. So we should we, maybe we want something that is more like this. Uh, can we move to semi-random graph model where uh, you know uh, the adversary can add edges within the, the within the clusters and re remove edges across clusters? Uh, can we still argue something? For us, it's not clear that the techniques that are here can, can do it. Um, right. So can we com come up with MPC algorithm that can get you to exact uh, again exact recovery? In the stochastic block model, so find a1, a2, but now you want to go down to the information theoretic threshold, or like polylog, even polylog factors in the information theoretic threshold, uh, or like make the spectral make that works in the, in these cases, and so on. Um, and uh, okay, and then you know understand this local dynamics, like in networks, like maybe we want to design heuristics such that you know um, you make sure that. Uh, we end up in less polarized situation situation in that case is where like we make sure that opinions are exchanged a little more. Um, it's not it's not clear like you know that this works as you know uh, is is helpful for that, but I'm saying like you know it's a nice direction as well that, that we can follow up on. Okay, so this uh, concludes like the yeah the first uh, uh, yeah 40, 40 minutes of this talk. Uh, I have a little more to say on correlation clustering next. Uh, but if there is any question on like you know modularity, feel free to ask now or at the end of the talk as well. I will have a bit of time if you want. But I want to mention the next uh, uh, um, correlation clustering result that is, I think, pretty interesting as well. So um, if there is no question, let me just move move forward. So um, yeah, just a quick question, Vincent. Yeah, so sure. have the parallel versions been considered where like, you don't pick vertices sequentially, but uh, like a, you're looking at subsets of vertices rather than a ah, single vertex. Yeah, and I, I don't slightly think so more. That. Yeah, that's slightly more powerful. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, I don't think this has been considered. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, probably we can. We should, yeah, it's it would be nice. It would be nice to do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Okay. So let me move to correlation clustering. So in correlation clustering, it's a different model for uh, our, our, our problem of finding dense subgraphs. So here is the problem. So you are given a complete graph now, and each, has a, each edge has a label, uh, either a plus or a minus. And the goal here is to partition your, your, your graph, your, the vertices of your graph, into as many clusters as you want again. So it could be like n cluster, it could be one cluster, doesn't matter. And the goal is to minimize the following objective, where you send over all clusters and um, you will uh, want to minimize, you will pay each plus edge that is across cluster and each minus edge that is internal to a cluster. So for each edge, uh, UV, where both U and V belong to the same cluster and it's a minus edge, you pay one. Each edge, UV, that is a plus edge for each U and V are in different clusters, you pay one. Okay. So that's uh, that's the objective. That's the way you want to to uh, that's what you want to minimize. 
It's a, it's a popular objective as well. Um, and uh, you can think of like, also you can think of like, you know, minus edge are like no edges in practice sometimes, and plus edge are the normal edges, like plus edge is like similarity, minus edge is like nothing, so maybe dissimilarity. Um, so that's, that's, that's the way you can think about them. Um, and uh, what's the previous work on this? So there is a simple pivot-based three approximation algorithm that is like uh, dating back from like maybe almost 20 years old, like probably 2004 or something, where you have to pick a random vertex, pick a random vertex, put all the plus neighbors, all the edge, all the vertices that have a plus neighbor to that to that vertex, with with this vertex that makes a cluster, and then you recurse on the rest. Uh, so that's a three approx. There is an LP-based uh, algorithm that gets you 2.06 uh, that dates back to maybe 2016 or 15 and uh, maybe 15 and the goal is to you, then you do you solve the LP that is the natural LP you can think of for this problem and you round it using a pivot based approach again so you will always pick a vertex and based on the LP values and on whether the edge is plus and minus you will attract the vertices to, to the cluster of that pivot and recurse on the rest so that's that's a usual approach. Uh, it's a pretty cool problem because again, it has very nice uh, uh, features. Um, so if you have Dijon clicks of plus edges uh, and no other plus edges in between, then the cost is zero, so you're very happy, and the output is the best solution is to put like you know uh, a cluster for each click. So it's it's nice. Again, the number of clusters is a function is is is, uh, is is a function of the input. It's like data driven. Again, it's like something that you know comes out comes out directly out of the of the um, of the objective, of the of yeah of the objective and of the input graph. And um, clusters, yeah, the clusters we are looking for are very dense plus edges subgraph with little plus edges expansion. Okay, if you have plus many 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 plus edges outgoing your cluster. It's not really a good cluster. Okay, so one important property that you know we had in this work, and I think it's it's pretty cool, is that you can always find a constant factor approximation to this objective that makes sense also intuitively. That is such that the density of the the number of plus edges within the cluster is at least like uh, 0.9 fraction of the total number of edges you can have, because if you have if your cluster is not as dense as this. If your fraction of edges is smaller than 0.9, then maybe there's a 10 approximation where I can take this cluster and make it like everyone and make a singleton cluster. Okay. And why is it okay to do that? It means that if my density, my plus edge density inside my cluster is below 0.9, it means that I have 0.1 fraction of my edges that are minus edges. So if I make this, if this was a cluster, I was already like paying like 0.1 fraction of my edges as cost. So now if I just multiply by a factor of nine, I can make everyone like a, 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 a single donor and forget about this cluster. So, you know, it's not changing too much. So I really care about like, you know, plus cluster that have a lot of uh, plus edge density. And um, okay, and another property of, of, of this is that, you know, if I look at the vertex and it belongs to some cluster, and if I have more than 0.9 fraction of my plus neighbors, uh, sorry, if I if I have less than my 0.9 fraction of my plus neighbors inside my own cluster, it means that I have at least a 0.1 fraction of my plus neighbors that are outside of my cluster. Okay, so that means that this vertex is already paying 0.1 fraction of its plus neighbors because it has already many neighbors outside. So um, what I can do is I take this vertex, put it out of the cluster, and be happy with it because in opt it was already paying like 0.9 fraction of its plus neighbor, and I was paying all its plus neighbor, so up to losing a factor of 10, this guy is now uh, happy as a as a as a singleton. So really, it means that these clusters they have to have very peculiar form, right? They are very dense inside, very lot of plus edges inside, and very small expansion because all the vertices inside have most of their plus neighbors inside and are made of a lot of plus edges, very almost clicks. Okay. So then we came up so with this. Is it, yeah. this sure. is a quick question. So is this 0.9 uh, significant here or just some 
arbitrary constant. Like, no, you can make it arbitrary constant, but like it, it has to be like maybe I think uh, at least two thirds or something. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, but essentially, yeah, it's like some some constant. Uh, we did not we we did not optimize too much the constant, but we want some gap. Uh, yeah, between that. Yeah, we so like two thirds should maybe two thirds or three quarters should work as well. Okay. So um good. So then in this work, we come up with this, uh, I think it's a, it's a very cute notion, very, I think it's very simple and very, very nice. Uh, it's uh, this notion of agreement. So what we want to look at, like take two vertices and look at their plus neighbors. So you can take two vertices and look at the vector, like the adjacency matrix defined by the, by the plus neighbors. So these are two vectors. Um, and uh, you can look at the symmetric difference between uh, between the uh, the plus neighbor sets. Uh, so you can maybe maybe that's just like the the the, the L one distance between the between the, the plus the plus neighbors vectors that you have. And uh, you can realize that actually if U and V belong to the same cluster, that means that this L one distance or like the symmetric difference is much smaller than uh, the maximum uh, norm, if you want, of the vector, the total plus neighbors. Okay, because if they are in the same, uh, if they're in the same cluster, then that means they should be connected to essentially the same set of vertices. If one has a lot of neighbors somewhere else, then that means that they are not really in the same cluster. So we can show that there exists an order one approximation to the problem, such that for any UV in the same cluster, then the you know this L1 distance is smaller than epsilon times the maximum of the two norm, the two the two the two L1 norm. And so what we are going to say is that if this happens, if we have two for any pair of vertices U and V such that this is true, we are going to define them. We are going to say that they are in agreement. They agree. Okay. And uh, we know that you know vertices. Uh, uh, like like in my there is a constant factor approximation such that for any cluster it's made on only of vertices that are in agreement. Okay, so I'm I'm really happy with that. So let's let's uh, so now let me give you a very simple constant factor approximation for correlation clustering. Of course, the approximation is like other ones, so it's not matching the three approximation that is done by the pivot, for example, or not the LP based, but it's very scalable, very simple. It's like you know something you know you can even teach. It's pretty pretty straightforward. So here's the algorithm, like four bullets, and then I'll be done. So it's um, so take your graph and discard. You can remove all the plus edges U V where U and V are not in agreement because we know that they are not going to be in the same cluster. So let's even remove the plus edge. We don't care. Okay. So fine. Now we call a vertex light if its plus degree has decreased by a constant factor. Like you know, if you if you have a vertex for which you have removed most of its plus edges at the previous step, it means that okay, it's very not much in agreement with many with most of with most neighbors. So we can maybe discard all the plus edges between light vertices. Vertices of very dense subgraph with low expansion are not light. Okay, so if you have a cluster, if you have a clique that is separated from the rest of the world, you are never going to remove uh, uh, plus edges between vertices of the clique. Like we know that vertices that belong to the same cluster, if it's a very strong cluster that is very tightly, densely connected with little expansion, we know that is not going to drop any plus edge. Uh, so we are happy. We should only we can discard the, the, the plus edges between light vertices because this one doesn't matter. So now we have discarded many plus edges. So what we can do is compute the connected components of the resulting graph. They're just the connected components, like simple algorithm, connected components. And that's our clusters. That's our output. We're going to just output uh, the uh, connected components cluster out of the graph where you remove first the edges that are between vertices that are not in agreement, and then plus edges that are uh, between vertices that have lost many of their neighbors. And then what we can show is the funny thing is that connected components of this graph have they at most four. Because if your graph has very large connected components, it's it's good, okay, it's fine for the correlation clustering algorithm, but we want to do it in a massively parallel environment. So if the connected component is large, then we have to pay many rounds to realize this. But here we can show that the diameter is at most four. So we can compute that in a parallel setting very efficiently. 
just the diameter of the kinetic component. So it's a very simple algorithm, three bullets, and uh, very easy to implement. So we did it, we implemented it, very easy to run at scale because kinetic components are very small diameter, so very fast, very, very good. And the cool thing here, okay, so we have the theorem, of course, which is, which is, which is that, you know, uh, there is a massively parallel correlation clustering algorithm, which gives you a constant factor approximation in constant number of rounds with the total memory being like the total number of plus edges, which is, you know, uh, what you, the best you can hope for. Like, you know, the plus edges is like, so that's the total, that's minimum memory you can have. Actually, uh, you can do two things out of this work. Uh, there's a follow-up work that just appeared on Archive, not by ours, but that are taking these ideas and they got like a sublinear time algorithm, constant factor approximation, and like a, a one pass streaming algorithm uh, using exactly the same thing, like uh, the framework we developed. So it's a, I think it's a pretty powerful tool for uh, collection clustering. But the interesting thing here that you can see on this graph, which is like uh, some uh, uh, collection clustering um, solution that we computed uh, on different graphs. So you can see like la pretty large graphs, like Twitter web base that are very big graphs. I don't remember exactly the number of nodes, but it's really, really, really large. And we can show the interesting phenomenon here is that, so this is our algorithm with different values of the constant for the agreement. We can use like different parameters. And um, we can see that uh, our algorithm, so blue, red, and, and brown, is really good in terms of approximation guarantee. And it's even better than, for example, the pivot, which is uh, presumably better, which has a presumably better approximation guarantee. But I think the reason for this is that in practice, like the pivot is not guaranteed to give you very dense subgraph because sometimes you pick a pivot, you attract all its plus neighbors. You may attract a few points that are like not densely connected. So sometimes you have like very much outliers in, this, in these things. And so in fact, for the correlation clustering algorithm, uh, it's of course it's all always within, within three factor approximation, but it's maybe sometimes much. I think here's the argument I want to make is that in practice, in practice, um, the correlation clustering algorithm, uh, the pivot algorithm, is uh, likely to, you know, be at the worst case or have a large approximation guarantee larger than uh, what we, that our algorithm here, which is really looking for dense subgraph, which is, which is what we are really interested in. Okay, so it seems that at least on, the, on this graph, that's what's happening. Okay, so this was like a ICML last, uh, last, last time, like uh, it's a, it was a long talk at ICML. So yeah, I think it's a pretty cool result. And here are a few open problems. Uh, so okay, of course, like the, the yeah the, the constant factor that we got for the paper for, for, for this it was not very uh, good, so it's not a very good constant. Uh, so if if one can improve the constant, that's great. So we also did not handle the weighted case, which uh, which is the case where like edges are weighted, for example, and then you pay to if you make a mistake, you pay proportional to the uh, weight of the edge. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a login approximation. The login approximation is tight unless you can improve the best known algorithm for multi-cut. So I don't expect that we can improve this too much, but it uh, would be good to at least match this in the MPC setting, for example. That would be very interesting. Uh, also, a natural question is like, you know, if I give you that I want like five uh, clusters that are or K clusters, uh, and as many singleton clusters as you want, but at least k non-singleton clusters, can you get uh, two to the k poly n approximation in constant number of rounds in the MPC setting? You can do it in the classic regime where you you you, you know you don't have to uh, to do in few rounds, but like you know, can you match the general regime in the uh, MPC regime uh, for the FPT setup? That would be nice. And I'm going to stop here and happy to take any question. Uh, hi, so uh, is to 2.06 the best one approximation factor? Yep, yep. 
and uh, what about the lower bound is, is there any uh -huh. good yeah so 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 there is an integrality gap for the lp of 2.06 uh, 2.2 of 2 right the integrality gap of the lp is 2 so the lp rounding is almost tight uh, but the apex harness for the problem is like 1. Uh, or five or something it's pretty low or maybe 1.1 or something so it's pretty low so there's a big gap here uh between the uh, lower bound and the and the, the i mean the integrality gap of the lp the harness and the best algorithm we have i mean i think the answer is going to be below two but uh, you know i don't know yet thanks So this uh, Lowen's algorithm that you are analyzing earlier. Yeah. Uh, so are there other combinatorial algorithms which have uh, like more sharper regimes closer to spectral algorithms in the uh, yeah. SPM model? Yeah, yeah. So there are, there are some things like this. So so for example, there is one where actually it's not too hard to modify the Louvain algorithm to get that. So one thing you could do, for example, is like uh, you start with um, so partition your input randomly into, let's say, like uh, log n groups. And then you order them. So group one, you pick a random partition. And then group two, group two you assign uh, each node of group two to part one of group two. If it has more neighbors in part one of group one, uh, sorry, part one of group two, if it has more neighbors in part one of group one, and otherwise part two of group two, if it has more neighbors in part two of group one. So you do like, you know, like kind of Louvain, but on different uh, on different groups. And then group three, you classify the vertices of group three based on the partition you get for group two, partition vertices of group four based on the partition you get for group three. So little by little on these groups, you are improving and improving the classification. And after log n groups, the last partition is the correct one, like you, the last groups is correctly partitioned. And so if the last group is correctly partitioned, you can repartition all the previous groups according to the last group and you will get like uh, the whole thing. So this algorithm, for example, where you partition into groups and then do the local decision group by group uh, will get you down to the information theoretic threshold up to a constant factor, I think, uh, or maybe up to a square root log n factor, I think up to constant actually. Uh, and and that that would work. Um, are there any other questions? So in this case, and uh, uh, like if you could get up to constant factors with this combinatorial algorithm, what is the incentive to? Like improve upon this Lowen's analysis. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no. I think I think what I want to say is that this algorithm is overfitted. It's like like many of these algorithms for the stochastic block model, they overfit to the stochastic block model in the sense that you know this algorithm that I just described to you, it's like two communities uh, balanced, um, and you know it's it's not very uh, robust to the model it is trying to optimize over. The good thing with Louvain is that we know it's it's useful in practice. It, we, we believe it works for many models. So we are trying to find evidence of why it works. And we are trying to understand um, what would be possible Im uh, improvement of this algorithm. Now, if we start with this other combinatorial algorithm, um, I think it's really overfitting. I have not tried it in practice, but essentially if I move to three communities, like essentially, you have to specify, for example, ahead of time, the number of clusters you are looking for. And uh, this is something you don't have to do for Luma, for example. So, you know, I would, I'm happy, like, you know, I would be happy if we could find like a, an algorithm that would be uh, up to the threshold that is not necessarily Luma, but that, you know, is not really overfit to uh, the stochastic block model. So you believe these uh, Lewin's algorithm might work in these semi-random SVM models? Is it? Uh, I uh, I wish I wish I wish uh, uh, I don't know if it I don't know if I believe it. I would like to yeah I mean hopefully yes hopefully yes yeah. Uh, 
I don't know how to show it, but that would be nice. That would be nice if we can do that. Yeah. For sure. Um, yeah, thanks. Sir. Yeah. No, I, th I think what's possible is to show better bounds for Louvain, that's for sure. Uh, but other than that, I think there is like, you know, some understanding to be gained from like, you know, why we can understand, why we can analyze Louvain, why we can't. And uh, if we, you know, um, I mean, my goal is not necessarily to show that Louvain would be the the best possible algorithm for like, you know, stochastic block model. But I think Louvain is not optimal in many ways. And for example, everything we have learned of the efficiency of stochastic, uh, sorry, of uh, spectral methods or SVD, or, um, as, uh, semi-definite program SDPs for solving the SBM, for example, these are um, nice uh, algorithmic ideas that I would like to, you know, embed into Louvain. Like I would like to, you know, make Louvain better or come up with a better algorithm, uh, but that is not really tailored to SBM. Also, like uh, tight is a uh, MPC, uh, like the correlation question. So the second open problem you have here. Yeah. The in the, the there's a hardness of approximation matching that, isn't it? Or? For 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 log in approximation for even in the non MPC case. Yeah, I mean, like it's the approximation uh, uh, ratio for uh, correlation clustering in general uh, when you have weight weight of on the edges is exactly the same as like a uh, multi-cut. I mean, the problems are equivalent. Like you can definitely like, you know, turn a multi-cut into a correlation clustering instance with weight, weight on the edges or turn a correlation clustering instance onto a multi-cut instance. Um, um, so the problem are equivalent uh, with the same approximation warranty. So it's like a gap resolving uh, reduction and uh, so now the best known we know for multicut is log n. So improving this, you know, not even in the MPC setup would be uh, would be an improvement for multicut. So for for so MPC, I, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Hypergraph versions of uh, say this uh, the, the first problem, the modularity has that has that been considered as well. Ah, uh, yeah, so I think it's NP hard to decide whether the modularity is zero or not. So I think uh, multiplicative approximation is like impossible, but it's, I'm not sure it's like totally convincing in the sense that, uh, yeah, I mean like, yeah, it's, um, it's just like a scale issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe we should look at additive approximation for modularity or we should look at modularity with some sort of offset maybe or something like i mean there's this issue that zero is np hard but uh i'm not sure it's it's uh, saying much about the hardness of modularity uh it's a little bit like bin packing right like bin packing is hard to decide whether like two bins or or, or, or not uh or like whether it, like you can you, know, you can't really approximate it like this but you know, uh, if you do plus one, then you can you can do it or something. So, so it's not uh, connections between modularity and like most like I guess it, you mentioned that it comes more from a statistical physics perspective, but yeah. like the other sort of more common uh, metrics like expansion and so on. <laughs> like I'm just wondering if like high modularity implies maybe yeah that's a good question this I, this i don't know yeah this i don't know the closest thing i can i can tell you is that if you look at the sbm and you try to uh, sbm with some degree specific degree distribution uh, and you look at trying to find the max likelihood partitioning then this will match the 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 modularity 
uh, objective. So max likelihood for this model matches the um, max modularity. So I think in that sense, it's like, so, and in, in that model, it corresponds, like the max likelihood also correspond to the most expansion, like the max expansion. Yeah, in that model, for example, it corresponds to sparse cut. So, so for example, in the stochastic block model, max modularity means, uh, you know, sparse cut, like, you know, the cut between the clusters is the sparsest, or like uh, max, uh, yeah, yeah. Mean conductance cut and so on. So, so. This type of thing. So that's the only connection I know, yeah. But it's a good idea to, you know, in the worst case, try to establish connections in that direction. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for accepting our invitation again, and for two talks, it was great. <laughs>